This session was part of the conference hosted by Ministry to Muslims. Scribe, click that bell, and check out all their information in the description below. So I'm not going to go long, and I'm just going to give an overview of reasons for Christianity. Um, now, of course, to see reasons for Christianity in a true sense, you must be regenerated because a non-regenerated person is not going to see Christianity as true. This is part of the work of the Holy Spirit to make somebody alive, to enable him to believe in the Christian doctrine. Man in and of itself is inherently evil. He's a slave to sin. He's dead in his sin. He doesn't want God, as Paul says in Romans 3. Uh, he doesn't seek out. He doesn't seek out for God. So thank God that the Holy Spirit made us alive in order that we believe. Reasons for Christianity um, starts with Christ as the very source of our salvation. And this is, of course, delineated. And again, I'm just going to give a brief overview. Um, this is delineated in a bounding, in a, an abounding amount of passages, both in the Old and New Testament. In 11 of Acts, chapter 11, verse 12, there is no salvation. There's salvation, nobody else. No other name under heaven given to men by which they must be saved. Note the Old Testament, the Old Testament data for salvation, which was exactly the same as the data for salvation. For example, this is the Old Testament message in Acts 10, 36 and uh, verse 43. It mentions what the Old Testament believers believed, how they saw the source of salvation. In verse 36 of chapter 10, we read that the word he sent out, Yahweh sent out to the sons of Israel, gospelizing is the participle there, gospelizing peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord over all. So there, this is the message that Yahweh sent to the Old Testament saints, to the Old Testament believers, gospelizing peace through Christ Jesus, he's Lord over all. And then in verse 43, all Pentas, all the prophets, testify of him that through his name, everyone that believes receives forgiveness of sins. It does not say everyone who is baptized, everyone who practices sacraments, everyone who performs meritorious works, at least enough, has forgiveness of sins. Luke did not contradict himself in his own theology. It's resting in Christ. It's believing in him. This was the Old Testament message to the saints, which is our message in the New Testament as well. The evidence is of Christianity is twofold. There's, as I see it, subjective evidence, which has to do with the transformation of life. It has to do with our knowledge of the maturity that we have in Christ. It has to do with our confession. And then there's objective evidence that has to do with the factual data, the factual verifiable proofs of the New Testament, such as the evidence for the New Testament and the doctrinal evidence for the Trinity, salvation through grace alone, in terms of the doctrinal evidence that justification is something that God does, that the Father does, on the basis of the cross work of Christ. Okay, at first I want to look at the subject of evidence of Christianity. Now, the subjective evidence, keep in mind, I, I can't tell you how many Muslims or Mormons, particularly I've talked to, that want to bear their testimony, or Jehovah's Witnesses, the same thing. In other words, everybody has a testimony. Everybody has a testimony. From the darkest cult to generating Christianity, everyone has a testimony. Keep in mind, in evangelism, a testimony does not replace the gospel. Now, you can include you know, some nuts and bolts in your testimony. But you got to get to the And as mentioned, my role is get to the cross as soon as possible. Because that's the ordinary means that God uses to save his people. Romans 1.15. Get to the cross. Get to the cross of Christ Jesus. The ultimate test, dealing with the evidence, the ultimate test for Christianity is a biblical confession. For instance, in Matthew 16.18, what was Peter's confession? You are the 
the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Son of God is tantamount to God the Son, but he acknowledged he's the Messiah. He's the Messiah, the Son of God. This is our confession. And Jesus said, upon this, the rock, that confession, I will build my church. This was the majority view of the early church fathers. It was not built on Peter. It was built on Peter's confession. You are Peter, but upon Epitalte, this, the rock, I will build my church. Not on Peter, but on this, the rock. Has the third, that pronoun there has the third person significance. This, the rock, not on you. You're Peter, but it's upon this. John's ultimate test, as mentioned earlier, is the perpetual incarnation. Everyone that believes that Jesus has come and remains, perfect against there, Eleuthida, comes and remains in the flesh, is of God. That's a confession we have. We don't believe that Jesus was resurrected and his body evaporated into gases, or Jehovah is hiding his body as witnesses believe. Also, genuine Christianity, meaning the faith that was result that resulted from regeneration, is ongoing. It's ongoing. The Bible does not see faith as transient. Someone that's actually regenerated. It does not does not know of anyone who was actually regenerate, regenerated in which the faith was the result, and all of a sudden they just, you know, they tried it out for a while. And they just don't believe anymore. The Bible has no example of someone that was actually regenerated. Now they're not. Ongoing faith is what we find in Scripture. Especially in the Apostle John's literature, he uses, in a salvific way, he uses participles. What's a participle? Well, a simple definition would be a verb. Oh, Joe just came to me. Okay. A participle would be a verb with an ongoing significance. For instance, the participle of run would be running. The participle of eat would be eating. Right? It has an ongoing significance. It doesn't tell you when it started, the verb. It doesn't tell you when it ends. It just tell you to, tells you it's ongoing. Now, in John's literature, he uses many participles to denote the Christian faith. The Christian faith, you know, in point of fact, as I see it, John's whole literature shows us in the entirety of his literature that Christianity is just, it's a, it's a doctrine of participle. We're always hearing, we're always believing, we're always coming to him. In John 3, 16 and 5, 24 and John 6, 47, where it talks about he who believes has eternal life, the word believe is a participle. He that is believing now, it's always believing, it's us has eternal life. Um, John 5, 24, Jesus, as recorded in John, said, whoever hears my word and believes the one who sent me has eternal life, not come into judgment, has crossed over from death to life. In the original, everyone hearing now, ongoing my word and believing the one who sent me has eternal life. And the verb for has is simultaneous grammatically with hearing and believing. That's us. We have eternal life. We're not waiting to see what's going to happen. And there's many other verses I can look at. Particularly in Revelation, the one who's overcoming, that Nike, the term for the one who's victorious, that's a participle. The one who's always victorious, that's us because we're Christian. We have the living Savior. We have a relationship with the living Savior. We don't stop believing. So John, in his theology, believing, believing and living in him is just part of the Christian life. This is, the again, the subjective evidence. In fact, one of the verses, one of my favorite verses that really denotes the idea of believing and living in him is John 11, 25 through 26. Jesus' words to Martha. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And if you know verse 26, literally, all the ones living and believing, here's how it literally reads, all the ones living and believing 
There's only one article before believing or living for the living and believing. There's one action there. Has eternal life. And it literally reads, will never, never, shall never, never, not even a possibility, perish. Into the ages. Now that last phrase, into the ages, eston iona, is not in any of our, it's not in most of our translations. That's what it actually says. It intensifies this double negative. Never, never, not even a possibility, will you perish into the ages. That's how it actually reads. It's not a textual variant. That's how it actually reads. So therefore, the subjective evidence of true Christianity is an accurate and sufficient confession, which we all have if you're a Christian, that he's the Messiah, the Son of God. He's God the Son. We hold to a triune God and justification through faith alone apart from works. You can't separate that. You can't say, I believe in Christ. I believe in his deity. I believe in the Trinity. But, you know, you, water baptism is something that you have to do. Hey, that, that's a work. That's something that requires energy. That's not a recognized gospel. Also, with our passion, we hold to the atoning cross work in the physical resurrection. And we eagerly await the second coming of God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we move to the objective evidence of Christianity, which is shown by things such as, this is not exhaustive, um, the evidence of the New Testament, the evidence of the doctrine of the Trinity, the documental evidence of the deity of Christ, and the evidence of salvation through faith alone. These things objectively are taught and exegetically taught in the pages of not just the New Testament, but the Old and New Testament. Now, keep in mind, I'll say on side, evidence is not a means of regeneration. Evidence can never regenerate somebody. Evidence does not lead someone to the Bible. Rather, we use the Bible to lead out the meaning. And the again, the ordinary means that God uses to save people in Scripture is through the proclamation of the gospel. That's what they did. That's what God said in Romans, through Paul in Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. The gospel, the cross work of Christ. His meritorious work. There's at least, dealing with some of the evidence of the New Testament, I'm not going to give it all, but there's at least 48 or 49 Greek manuscripts that are before the 4th century. That's a lot. At least 40% of the New Testament are within these manuscripts, or most of the New Testament are within these manuscripts. There's about 18 manuscripts within the 2nd century that contain about 40% of our New Testament within the century in these 18 manuscripts. Um, as of 2020 or 2019, because we keep getting more information on manuscripts, we can't use the old, you know, Josh McDowell information, it's just antedated. But as about 2019, there's about 140 papyri manuscripts written on papyrus. Papyrus is from a papyrus plan. They would take the reed and they would make it into a page. You know, the oldest manuscripts that we have are written on papyri. Right now we have about 140. They date back to the second century. No other work of antiquity has that much fidelity or veracity. 140 man, uh, papyri manuscripts. Right now we have 2,000 to 3,000 gospel manuscripts, about eight or eight, 50 manuscripts of Paul. In terms of manuscript number, and you know the number keeps going up because we find any more that are cataloged. We have a lot of manuscripts that are not cataloged, but we have them. We have about 5,838 Greek manuscripts. That's not even counting the New Testament version. Oh, 6,000 6, Greek manuscripts. It was a manuscript. It was a handwritten copy in the same language. Almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts we have right now to, to say. Interesting, the average size of a manuscript is about 400 pages. In fact, if 
we got all the manuscripts that we have cataloged and we just laid them out and counted the pages. There's about 2.6 million pages of Greek New Testament. Six point or 2.6 million, 2.6 million. Nothing even comes close in works of antiquity. Also, we have patristic evidence, you know, writings of the church fathers. To date, we have about a million patristic citations. We have almost about 35,000 come before Nicaea. 35,000 citations, about 32 actually, that come before Nicaea. In the New Testament version, about 20 to 30,000 of new, in different languages. Um, 10,000 in alone, but there's a lot of Latin, Coptic, Syriac, Georginian. There's so many different language manuscripts we have. 20 to 30,000 right now. The evidence is overwhelming. We also have, which I always mention, very interesting, dates around the 34th century, a Syriac translation of the Bible. Again, 34th century. And this was, as I mentioned, this was the translation in Arabia. In other words, when Muhammad or anyone else speaks about the, the book, people of the book, Christians, this is the Bible that the Christians had. There is no, there was no Aramaic or Arabic translation until the ninth century. This is what they had, the Peshitta, the Syriac Bible. And in the Peshitta, there's about 20, the earliest edition has 22 books. But it's very interesting. I'm not going to name them all, but the Peshitta, which the Christians in Arabia used, and if anyone read Muhammad, the Bible, it would have been this, from this translation. I always ask Muslims, what translation did Muhammad have access to? It would have been this. There was no other translation. Syria. But in it, Mark 1.1 1, 1 refers to Christ as the Son of God. Mark 14.62 has the entire narrative of the priest wanting to condemn Christ because Christ affirmed that he was the Messiah and the Son of God. It goes on. He says, I'm the son of man who's coming in the clouds, right hand of power. So he's claiming he's deity and distinct from the Father. That's intact in Mark 6, uh, 1462. Um, John 1 1, John 1 14. Also, it's interesting in the Peshitta, John 1 18 has the equivalent phrase in Syriac, no one's ever seen God, the, from the Greek, monogamous baos. One and only God, who is always in the Father's bosom, has explained him. That's how the Peshitta reads. Only begotten God, or one and only God. Which agrees with the critical text. Um, the creator, the crisis creator passages are intact in this translation. Again, this was the one that the, the Christians in Arabia used. In John 1.3, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, the Son is presented as creator. Also in John 14, 14, interestingly, agreeing with the critical text in the Bashida, 3rd or 4th century, it has Jesus in John 14, 14, telling his disciples to pray to him. It has the pronoun me. Whoever prays to me, whoever asks me. And all the uh, gospel and the resurrection, the ascension are intact. All the resurrection, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension are intact in the Bushida. More evidence comes from the Trinity. We have the evidence of the Trinity, that this is the evidence of Christianity. And I don't have to take a long time. We, we heard a fantastic presentation of the Trinity. All of us should be familiar with the doctrine of the Trinity in terms of presenting the simplicity of it. One God revealed in Philippians, where I use uh, there is one God, or there are three divine persons who share the nature of the one God. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Co-equal, co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. There's three persons presented as God ontologically, not merely in representation. And we have verse, abounding verses, that teach he's ontologically God. He's identified as Yahweh in the New Testament. 
and the Old Testament. Um, plus, we have the claims of Christ. Also, we have the distinctions between the Father and Son. That's very important because, unfortunately, too many Christians will define the Trinity to Muslims and to other Unitarian groups in oneness terms, not because they're oneness, because they just don't know how to explain the simplicity of the Trinity. It sounds really oneness. Or, equally as worse, they define salvation as functional Catholics in a functional Roman Catholic way. We don't want to do that. We want to take the biblical data and be accurate because God is a God of precision. We want to be precise in our explanation of who God is. Um, now there is the evidence of the cross work. The gospel were the earliest, earliest evidence of the cross work of Christ. The earliest evidence are the document in the New Testament. Interesting, I'm not going to give you a bunch of verses, but I'm going to quote one of the earliest Christian creeds that we have is in 1 Corinthians 15, dealing with the cross work of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul's writing 1 Corinthians 50, around 54. It's easy to compute that, arrive at that number. Earliest creed. Listen to 15, verse 1. Paul says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. Now listen, which I preached. Past tense there, an Aries indicative. Which I preached. Not when I'm preaching to you right now. In other words, they already had the tradition of the work of Christ. So he's not saying, look, I'm giving you this new information right now. No, they're, they're all Arius past tense verbs here. What I preached, which also you receive, same tense in the past, in which you now stand, having stood, perfect. Verse 2. By which also you are saved if you hold to fast, fast to the word which I preach, same tense, to you unless you believe in vain. Now here's the creed, verse 3. It's creed. It really is. <clears throat> For I delivered, various indicative, past tense, not what I'm delivering to you right now, what I did deliver to you is of I'll tell you why I like this word. He says, first of importance, in the Greek, it's protos. We get the word protein. First of importance, protos, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. This is the already established tradition in 54. Also, what I received that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, he was buried and was raised on the third day, according to the scripture. That this is our creed. Now, the Christ that Paul preached was the two natured person. So it's not as though he leaves his doctrine of Christ hanging with no definition. This is the Christ that died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And was buried, he really died, was buried, and was raised up on the third day. And we know Galatians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, which was written maybe around 46. Paul says he consulted the other apostles to make sure his doctrine was correct. And it was. So it wasn't something Paul was made, making up. In fact, Paul's literature is the earliest accounts of the resurrection and the cross work of Christ. again was written around 8054 marks one of the earliest Christian creeds and then in verse 5 here's some of the evidence in verse 5 he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12 then he appeared to more than 500 people 500 people you don't get that from hallucination those were individualistic 500 people and 500 people would put you or anyone in the electric chair if there were 500 witnesses that you did some kind of crime 500 people and Paul says, most of them are still alive. Check it out. 500 witnesses. Could they all have made up this 
this account, like all of them just kind of made it up? Was there not one psychologically balanced person, the whole group, that would have protested? Said, no, this, this is all some kind of fabrication. They died for what they believed. People don't die for a lie. Also, the author, the authors were dropping some heavy names dealing with the resurrection of Christ. They were dropping names like Joseph of Arimathea and the priest, Caiaphas, who could have easily dis disproved all these accounts. And you have testimony of women, which was completely abnormal. It couldn't have been a myth because myths take thousands, hundreds and maybe thousands of years to develop. It could have been a myth. And then, which I think is very fascinating to me, within the gospel narrative, you have incidental detail. Now, incidental details, as concurred by, by lawyers and historians, is very common in eyewitness accounting. For instance, I'll name a couple. We read in the gospel narrative that John outran Peter. What in the world, I mean, what reason would the author have to write, John ran faster than Peter in John 20? Also, we have this, uh, he bent over and looked. Now, the only kind of tomb that re requires someone bending over and look was the bench tomb. The bench tomb. Right. They saw striped linen lying there, a burial cloth folded, you know, with no reason why all these incidental details was communicated. Why in the world would they fabricate something like that? All right, one, and one more interesting, interesting incident of deep, incidental detail, mostly in Mark. It records Jesus, and he uses this interesting term, parablepo. It records Jesus gazing intensely to someone before he would speak. So, and the Greek makes this super clear. It's very interesting. Almost bizarre. Before he would speak, he would just gaze intently. That's the term. And then he would speak. Incidental details add reliability to the account. Counterproductive details. Testimony of women. Um, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus seemingly denying that he was good. Seemingly, we know he did. Uh, his scandalous association with tax collectors and prostitutes. His laxity on, on fasting, his being baptized. Um, why in the world will we have all these counterproductive details if the authors made it up? We don't have any of them. And also we have the account of patristics, where I'm not going to go through them, but in the, some of the earliest patristics, we have the account of Jesus, I think it was Ignatius, yeah, uh, Ignatius in his middle recensions, meaning the genuine letters of Ignatius in Ephesians, he wrote a letter to Ephesians right in around 107. Like this, I mean, a little brash, but he says, being followers of God and steering up yourself, and he uses this phrase, by the blood of God, you have perfectly accomplished the work which was beseeming to you. By the blood of God, similar to Acts 20:28. 20, and I can go on with Polycarp and the, just the patristic quotations are abounding that teach the cross work of Christ early. I'm not talking after Nicaea, pre-Nicene fathers affirming the deity of Christ, his distinction from the father and the cross work. And we have a lot of secular evidence of non-believers affirming events in the scriptures, like the darkness by Thales writing around 56, trying to explain it. Oh, it's some kind of eclipse. He was a non-believer. He's just trying to explain the darkness away. 56 AD, he's trying to explain the darkness away by, it was some kind of eclipse. He was refuted, though, because there was no eclipse at that time. And then other Jewish leaders and secular leaders, Josephus, Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, all affirming that the Christians believed in the confession that we find in Scripture. And if there was no resurrection, Jesus Christ, in, in my clothes, if there was no resurrection, then Jesus Christ was a false prophet. Because he said, destroy this temple, and I'm going to raise in three days. Peter said, we didn't follow 
cleverly invented stories when we told you about his majesty. We were eyewitnesses. We, we saw it with our own eyes. Paul says over 500 people were there. The critics are thousands of years too late. They're too late. They weren't there. The resurrection was based on factual evidence, factual proof, eyewitness accounts, and the prophecy of the Lord to destroy this temple. And I, showing he was the agent of his own resurrection, not just showing he was the Messiah, but it proved he was God. It proved he was the Messiah. And finally, the evidence of justification through faith alone, which we find over and over and over, the reason why the authors spent so much ink, so much ink, on teaching that justification is chorus cor ergon apart from works is because the converse to that teaching, the converse to that, that teaching mocks the cross work of Christ. It has you climbing on the cross with Christ, helping him. I mentioned earlier that Roman Catholic has Jesus as an impotent junior kind of savior who really can't save. Every group that denies justification through faith alone has a defect in their Christology. Don't tell me you believe in Christ, that he's the Messiah, that he's God in the flesh, when you deny his words. You can't bifurcate the two. It is his doing, God, Paul says, that we are in Christ Jesus, who became the wisdom of God and became our righteousness. This just turns over and refutes orthodox. Roman Catholicism, all the groups that have a works-based autosatiric salvation. It is doing it here in Christ Jesus, who became our righteousness. He became our righteousness, and he became our sanctification and redemption. Therefore, whoever boasts, let him boast in the Lord, because it is doing. And lastly, John gives the purpose of him. He's the only author of the Gospels that actually give us the purpose of why he wrote why he wrote his gospel in John 20, 31. Twofold. Listen to the twofold reason. These have been written, Hina, in order that, that you may believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. It's apologetic. These things have been written that you be believe that he was the Son of God, God in the flesh. Apologetic. And that by believing, you may have life in his name evangelistic. It's both apologetic and evangelistic. So the true Christianity, the mark of true Christianity, is love and doctrine. And we find subjective evidence, we find factual, objective evidence, but the basis of salvation is Christ. He's the source, and we evangelize through the source of the gospel, the proclamation, the only ordinary or the ordinary means that God chose. This session was part of the conference hosted by Ministry to Muslims. Scribe, click that bell, and check out all their information in the description below. May the Lord keep you and bless you.